Okay, so for last class, we were supposed to be watching the 4.5 lecture. And so I did take attendance based on the comments, but unfortunately there were only two people that commented. So those are the only two people that were marked present for Tuesday. Um, if you click here on the week three class recordings, or week 13, I'm sorry. Um, the This is just the copy of the paperwork that I'm using. Um, but if you watch this video, at any point in the video, you can start commenting. Um, and it just said it a reminder to mark be marked president, please present, please post a question or post something you learned in the comments. And so I had two people um, post about that. So those are the only two people that I had marked present. Now I can change your attendance for Tuesday if you do come in here and post a uh, comment, okay? So if you come in here later and you watch the video and you make a comment, I will go ahead and go back to the attendance board and mark you present for Tuesday. Um, any questions about that? Let me make sure that my sound is on because I know in the past, um, okay, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Okay, it good. Was, and I it can was all on. Perfect. Thank you. Did you have a question? No. Um, no? Just, uh, you know, my, uh, my computer was completely broken and so was my phone. <laughs> yeah, things are looking rough on the technological side <laughs> okay um make sure that you for especially for the final exam right and the test yeah. um either come to campus because i think they have places where you can um like be in a room and you can take your tests yeah i i, um, I understand that i i hope i can get a ride but we'll we'll just have to see if not uh, i can just keep using this little laptop here it's slow, but I'm sure it'll work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, just keep me posted. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Um, I had a request from one of the students to kind of do like what I did the last time. So I printed off the review that's inside the My Lab Math or My Math, yeah, My Lab Math. And um, I just kind of wanted to go over the problems that were similar to ones that were on the test. But if we have time, we can get to the other problems on this review that were not on the test or similar to the ones on the test. Um, I just noticed that there were quite a few problems on this review that are not like anything on the test. And then vice versa, I also found a couple of problems that are on the test that we're in this review. So I definitely need to address both of those issues as we go through this. Um, and then before we start, I just kind of wanted to give you guys an idea of the remaining timeline for our class. Um, so today we're going to go over um, the review for test three. Um, the test three will actually be available online. So we won't actually have like a class period on Tuesday the 22nd, but I will set the date for the test, um, the last day that the campus is open before the Thanksgiving holiday. So the test will be due um, by Wednesday, 11-23, okay? So I will make that the deadline for um, test three. So essentially from today until next week, you almost have exactly a week. OK, so work on your review. Try to get that score as high as possible. Work on your my math lab assignments. Try to get those scores as high as possible um, and go in and take that test before Wednesday, before 11.59 p.m. So make sure you do give yourself about two hours for the test. So you don't want to start at the 11 o'clock hour. You probably want to start no later than 10 p.m. if you want to finish before the deadline. OK, it does cut you off at 11.59 a.m. So if you start at 11 p.m., then you're only going to get that 59 minutes. It'll just kick you out at 11.59 p.m. So always make sure you start early enough so that you get all the time that you could have, okay? Um, and then, of course, we don't have any 
classes on Thursday as well, because that's the Thanksgiving holiday. So both of these days, classes do not meet. We're just worried about taking that final exam and enjoying your Thanksgiving holiday, okay? When we return, we're just gonna be concentrating on the review for the final. And so since we have two days, we'll actually be able to cover everything we need to cover for the review for the final, okay? And we won't need to rush through any sort of bits or skip around anything, we're gonna cover all of it, okay? Um, Tuesday, December 6th, there's no classes, but that's because Friday, December the 2nd is the official last day of classes, okay? So that last week is just final exam week, okay? You don't have your regular class periods. You just show up to take your final exams whenever your final exams are, okay? Now, because our class is a remote class that starts at 12 p.m., on Thursday the 8th, we're supposed to have our exam at 12 p.m. However, what I've done is the exam should take about two hours. So instead of locking guys into that 12 p.m. to 2 p.m., I kind of went an hour in each direction. So you will have a specific window between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. to get your final exam done, okay? It's not of those that you can just go in whenever and take it whenever, as long as you take it before the deadline, okay? This one will only be open for those hours from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., and it if you don't get in there by 11 a, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., you won't be able to take the final exam. So that one's way more restricted than my regular tests. It's a departmental final exam, so they're a little bit um, more restrictive with their timelines on those, those exams. Um, so just make sure the test is timed at one hour and 50 minutes. That's the standard final exam time for the department. So make sure that you start no later than 1 p.m. so that you get those entire two hours to take that test, okay? I'll keep reminding you guys about the final exam, especially when we start talking about the review for it, okay? But we don't have any more new information. If you did get a chance to watch the 4.5 um, lecture video, there's nothing new outside of that. That was literally the last section of new content, okay? So from here on out, we're just kind of re going back and reviewing everything. So for now, we're just going to review the chapter four stuff. And I think it was like sections from three, uh, chapter, I'm sorry. So once we cover that, then we'll take this test and then we'll go in and kind of review everything from the beginning, which is going to be a challenge, but it's okay. <laughs> we'll be able to, to put it all together. Um, and the another thing, all of our unit tests in open notes, right? Um, the final exam is not that lenient. And that is a department standard, not my choice, because you know me, I let y'all use all your notes. Um, but for the department, you're only allowed one page of notes. So when we start covering that final review, I think you should wait until then to start formulating what you would put on your note sheet. Okay? And it has to be a regular standard paper, eight and a half by 11 inches. Um, and you can use front and back. And you can put whatever you want on there. So if you want to put rules, theorems, properties, um, examples, anything that you think you might need once you see that review, um, anything that you might need for the actual final exam, okay? And we will go over the review for the final a lot like the way we've been going over these review for the test. So I'll kind of give you an idea of which problems to concentrate on and maybe even throw in a couple of extra that will be a little bit similar to the ones that you'll see. OK, um, so for this test, I just the review for test three, I circled some problems that I want you to concentrate on. Um, and then I'm going to actually address the problems that are not on this review first. OK, so if you want, make sure to make a note that when you do the review, concentrate on numbers two, three through eight. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I know you can't see them at the bottom, but they're there. Okay, so essentially one through eight so far, nine and 10, so one through 10. These are not like ones on the test, but they're good for conceptual um, learning, right? To make sure that you've grasped the concepts. So they are on the review, but they're just not similar to the ones that are on the test. 13 is similar. You will have some conversion going on on the test. 
So it's the same with 14 through 16. Those are all going to be converting. We will have some solving equations. It's just not any of this specific type, okay? But you definitely need to practice solving equations. So we've got those in there for practice. Um, and again, I selected this one versus the other ones, but we are still going to be covering some solving um, equations. I did see two problems that had to do with pH levels. So they're more like problems 24 and 25, not necessarily like 26, but 26 does kind of help you practice the same thing from number 24, okay? Um, then the last two problems on the review, again, another pH level problem, and then this problem here, okay? So that was what was in the review. I did not create your homework, by the way, and I did not create your test reviews. Um, the only thing I'm at liberty to create is your tests, and that's pretty much it, because then the final exam is covered by um, the department. Um, so I didn't pick all these problems, and I'm sorry, but these are just not similar to the ones on the test, okay? There were some problems, and I went ahead and labeled them 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33. These are not in the My Lab Math um, review, but I wanted to include these as we review because these are similar to things that you would see on the test. Okay. So I'm just going to go through these first. Since you have these kinds of examples in your test three review, then you could go into that assignment and you know try to figure out how to do the answers. So if we run out of time today, you still have some way to figure out how to do these problems if we don't have time to cover them, okay? Whereas these, there's no example for them in the review. I mean, you could hunt around in your homework to see if you can find examples that look like this, but it'll be a little bit more troublesome. So I'm going to go ahead and cover these first. So these are for sure going to be similar to the ones you'll see on the test, okay? Never exactly the same, but similar, okay? Um, so as we do these, I'm going to write the properties that I'm using just so that if you're making a note sheet with just formulas, um, you'll know which formulas you need. Okay. So for this problem, it tells us to solve the equation and that's all it says to do. It just says solve. And there's a couple of ways to solve this equation. Okay. Um, I'll put a bracket down, but there's two ways to solve and you choose which way. I have a preference and I'll show you that preference in a minute. So the first is to use the definition of logs or logarithms. I just say logs for short. And that rule is that if you have, oh, what do I want to write it at? If I have the base an exponent equal to a, then it would look like log with the same base, but then I would have an argument equal to that exponent, okay? So, and I really don't wanna use x because then you might get confused with the x's in your problems. So I'd rather use c. So notice I'm just using a, b, and c so that you can kind of find the positions and then put them in the correct, in a different form. So if I use the definition of logs, what I have here is that my base is two. So when I rewrite it like a logarithm, it's gonna look like log with that base. And that base happens to be a two. And then the log, you have to take the log of something, okay? So L-O-G by itself or even L-N by itself makes no sense. It ha you have to take the log of something, okay? So writing this alone is like an incomplete sentence. I have to actually have an argument, okay? And the argument comes from whatever's on this side of the equation, which up there happens to be 10. And then it should equal what was in the exponent, which was an x, okay? Then from here, we use our change of base formula. And that tells you that if you have log base B of an argument, you simply just do ln of the argument over ln of the base. 
Okay. So that's another one of our rules. So for me to compute this, I would have to do ln of my argument over ln of my base two. And then that I can type in my calculator. Um, if they want the exact answer, this would be the exact answer. I don't know how well this is gonna pop up. It's yellow, <laughs> but that's the exact answer. That did not look well. I have to use a different color. Um, and then if you want the rounded answer, you gotta use your calculator. So eight clear fraction, ln of 10. And then downstairs, I'll put ln of two. Oops, I forgot my two. There you go. And it's about 3.321. Okay. So depending on whether or not they want the exact answer or they want the rounded answer, one of these two things will be your answer. It just depends on the directions in my math lab and on the test, okay? Now for number, this problem here. Oh, I wanna do it a second way. The second way is the way I prefer to do it, okay? And when I see this problem, I like to do what's called the, um, it's like the inverse property, okay? So I'm gonna say using inverses. And so then if I wanna get rid of a base two, what you wanna do is you wanna apply a log with base two. But if I'm gonna apply, if I'm gonna take the log with base two of this side, I have to take log base two of the other side, okay? Then once I have that, remember that bases cancel each other out if they're the same. If you have a log base two and an exponential base two, logs and exponentials are inverses of each other. So they essentially cross each other out, leaving me with just the X itself. And over here, how do you type that in your calculator? You would have to use the change of base formula, which is ln of 10 over ln of two but just you get the exact same answer as you had before, okay? So we'll still get x equal to 3.321. I just like using the, the log bases. So from there to there, I use the change of base formula which is over here, okay? So both of them are about the same number of steps. It's just, which way do you wanna do it? Do you wanna convert the original equation into an equation of a different form and then try to put it in your calculator? Or do you wanna use the inverses of exponentials, which is logs, and then eventually cancel it out and you still have to do the change of base formula. So there's really two ways to do it, okay? I personally prefer this way. So when I keep going, um, I'm gonna just keep doing it this way. I'm not gonna do it this way anymore, okay? But if you like this way, then that's totally okay to do. You'll get the same answers, okay? But I'm just gonna use the inverse property all the time. The only time that I don't use the inverse property is when I have exponentials on both sides with the same base, or when I have, um, Oh, what is it called? Uh, logs on both sides. When you have logs on both sides, you have to do that. Because remember this rule? You have a to the power x equal to a to the power y. And it tells you basically the exponents have to equal each other. And it's the same thing with the logs. If you have this, then those arguments have to equal each other. Okay. So you don't have to do any inverses going on there. You just take the top or take the arguments and you're done, okay? And that's essentially exactly what we'll have to do on number 30 because you do have logs on both sides, right? Just like you do here. The problem with number 30 is that I don't have just one log on the left side. 
I have one log on the right side, right? This is a natural log. So I have one log over here, but I don't have just one log on this side. So in order for me to make that just one log, um, I'm going to use my log property. And so I have this property right here is called the product property. So it says when I have two logs with the same base and I'm adding them together, I can write them as one log by multiplying those arguments together. And it doesn't matter whether it's log or whether it's ln, the property still applies. Okay. So I'm going to use that property, log base b of this plus log base b of that should equal log base b of x times y, okay? So then these two together will become ln and then three minus x times negative two minus x. Now this looks exactly like that rule that we had up there. So I'm going to apply that rule. So then if this is ln and that is ln, then this argument, the whole thing must be equivalent to this argument. And then from there, you just have to kind of foil it out and see what you have, whether you're left with a linear equation or whether you have a quadratic equation to solve, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and distribute this. So three times negative two, three times negative x, negative x times negative two, and then negative x times negative x. And then over here, there's no co no number to distribute and no exponent to apply. So I really don't need that set of parentheses. Now I do have an x squared in here. So I'm pretty sure it's a quadratic equation. So I'm gonna wanna move these two guys over to the other side, okay? So I'm gonna minus three on both sides. I'm gonna add nine x on both sides. So I have negative nine, and then all of these guys, that would be negative one x plus nine, which would be positive eight x. And it's not in the correct order, right? So you can rearrange it to be in the correct order, but that's a minus nine. So when it moves to the back, it needs to stay minus nine, okay? And here you can either do it by quadratic formula or you can do a factoring. It depends on you which way you want to go. This is very easy for me personally to factor, so I would factor it. But if you want to use quadratic formula, by all means, use the quadratic formula. Chances are most of you are going to use the quadratic formula, so I'm going to write it down. Quadratic formula. But if you're good at factoring, you should be able to get the answers right away. So it should be negative not no positive nine and negative one which would mean your answers are going to be one and negative nine um but we'll see it when the quadratic formula so bear with me while i write it down Um, and so then now we're going to plug this in. So if I'm trying to identify what A is, A is like an invisible one that's in front of the X squared. B is this positive eight. And then C is a negative nine. So when I put it in the formula, I'm going to have negative of my eight plus or minus my eight squared minus four times A times C, the whole thing over two times A. So I get negative eight plus or minus, and I'm not sure about that. So eight squared minus four times one times negative nine. I get, ooh, 100, that's nice. Because there is a square root of 100. So this is actually negative eight plus or minus 10. Let me move my paper up a little bit. So then I have two problems in there, right? Negative eight, why did I do that? 
I'm already doing it. Negative eight plus 10 over two, and then negative eight minus 10 over two. So that would be two over two, which is one, and then negative 18 over two, which is negative nine, okay? Now be careful before you box these or select them in the, in the computer for your test, okay? You have to make sure that when you plug these back that you don't get negative arguments. So right now, if I were to try to plug back one in the original, three minus one would be two, and that's a positive, so that's okay. But negative two minus one would be negative three, and that's not okay. So this one doesn't work in one of the arguments. So this one is not a solution. Okay, now let's go check the negative nine. So if you have three minus a negative nine, the double negatives will turn to plus. So it's actually three plus nine, which is 12. And 12 is good. Same thing here, negative two minus a negative nine. The two negatives is gonna make this negative two plus nine, which is seven and seven is good. Here, a negative nine times another negative nine is gonna give me positive 81 and three plus 81 is gonna be 84 and that's good as well, okay? So negative nine is a solution. So when you go to select your answer, make sure you're picking the answer that only has the one that, that checks out, okay? Because as a distractor, they will have this one by himself, this one by himself, and then both of them together, okay? And so you really need to know, even though you got those numbers, um, they still may not be a solution. So always double check. And I'm going to write here, not a solution because it makes at least one of the arguments um, zero or positive. I'm sorry, zero or negative. When you plug these numbers in, you cannot get zero and you cannot get negative as an argument. Your arguments must always, always, always be a positive number. And zero is not a positive number. Zero is a neutral number. It's the only neutral number there is. It's not positive and it's not negative. Okay, now there was a word problem I saw on the actual test. Um, and so I definitely wanna make sure that we know how to do this kind of word problem. It wasn't exactly like, uh, not even similar to the word problems that I saw in the um, review. So I'm gonna another word problem up here. And I will post these. So if you don't get to scribble everything down, no worries. You'll be able to copy it down later. Just leave yourself some space and then you can copy it down. Okay, so same thing with these because they have like paragraphs, right? Um, but this one says, the growth in population of a city can be seen using the formula P of T equal to 4211, 4211, E to the 0.002 T where T is the number of years since 1947. And it says, use this formula to calculate the population in 1956, round to the nearest whole number. So if T is the number of years since um, 1946, we have to figure out how many have passed, right? So T would equal whatever year I'm in or being asked about, minus the year that this thing starts at, right? So apparently all this data starts at 1946. So I actually end up with 10. And I'm pretty sure you could have looked at that and know it was 10 years, but I'm just showing the math in case it wasn't obvious, okay? Once you know what that T value is, you're essentially just plugging it in.
So when you plug this in, make sure you're putting it in the calculator correctly. So when I put it in my calculator, I'm gonna have four, two, one, one, and the E button is up here. So I'm gonna hit second and then the E and then 0 0.002 parentheses 10. So it should look exactly like it does on my paper, okay? And as soon as it does, you can hit enter and it says round to the nearest whole number. Well, zero is not gonna make six go up. So it's just going to be a lot of space for this problem, I don't know why. <laughs> I guess I thought it was gonna be more complicated than it was. But apparently the population would be 4,296 now. And it doesn't tell me the population of what. I don't know if this is people or what it is. Raccoons, like population of what, right? We don't know. But in 10 years, they only got like 85 more. <laughs> That's it. Okay, so another problem down here. Again, I saw it on the test, similar to this, not exactly, but similar. Um, and so we need to talk about how would we do a problem like this. Now for this one, you're using all of your properties and three properties in particular. So I'm gonna write those down. The first one that you would have to use when you're trying to write them as a single logarithm. So when you say it, when you hear it say, write it as a single logarithm, you have to do it in this order. So the first thing you have to do is you have to apply this rule. So basically any coefficients that you have will have up to your exponents. Then you would use um, this rule. And there's like two of them in this rule. So you could use, doesn't matter really the order, but it would be this group of rules would go next. Okay, so I'm gonna put a little thing like this. I don't know why my hand is not writing. It's just doing its own thing today. Okay, so we're gonna do both of these rules. These rules go together. Okay, and essentially what it go, boils down to is that if they're being added together, they get multiplied on the inside. And anybody that's getting subtracted, that argument will go in the denominator. Okay, but I first have to apply rule one. So when I apply rule one, there's no number in front of these guys. So those are not going to change at all. I'm just rewriting them exactly the way they were. But this two does have to become this guy's exponent. So then it's actually m squared there. And then from here, if I put this rule first, because I have a plus, so that would be log a of x times y. And then if I use the minus rule, I get log a of this argument divided by that argument. So it'd be x, y together on top, and then the m squared by itself at the bottom. Now, for this one, you do have to show, you know, your answer, but it is possible to look at that and know that that's going to be the answer, okay? So for this one, I always say, you know, it'd be best if you tried to show some work, but if, you're not, if you don't need to and you got the right answer, I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's not a problem, okay? So here I applied rule two, and then here I replied rule two again, just a different one. There we go. So you kind of know where everything came from. So these two came down and this one got manipulated, right? This number went up to the top. So it kind of just explains what happened. So we rewrote, rewrote, that guy went up to the top. Then plus it made us multiply the arguments. And then with the minus, it made us divide those arguments.
Now the kind of like partnering problem with this, right? It's um, it's alternatives. It's the other way around. They're gonna give me a log like this, and they want me to expand it out to look like that. Okay, and so notice what it says here. Excuse me. It says expand, simplify if possible. Assume that all the variables represent positive real numbers. It says that too up there. Assume all the variables represent positive real numbers. And the reason why is because you can't use the properties unless those arguments are positive. Okay. So they kind of just tell us your arguments are positive. So go for it. Um, same thing here. So I have log base two this time instead of log base A. Does it make a difference? All it means is every time I do a step, I have to write log two. Okay. But here, when you're doing the expanding, it's like the reverse steps. So the first step that you apply is the log, um, the, the, the subtraction rule. Then the next one you apply is the multiplication one. And then you get to apply the other rule, which was okay, but we're kind of in the reverse. So instead of going in that direction, we're going in the other direction. Okay. So the first rule I'm gonna have to do is splitting up the, the division. So I have a division. I need to write log with the same base of the top minus log with the same base of the bottom. So for here, when I apply rule one, I'm gonna get log two of the top minus log two of the denominator. Okay, I'm just applying rule one. Then if I apply rule two, rule two says is if I'm multiplying two variables of my argument, right, I can separate them into two separate things with the plus in the middle. So this x times y cubed is going to become log 2 of x plus log 2 of y cubed. And then this one's just coming down. I just don't need the parentheses for it. And then finally, the last step we use is that bringing down the exponents. So we have an exponent. We need to bring it to the front of the log. So this one doesn't have an exponent. So it just stays like that. But this one has a three, which needs to go right in front of that log. And this one has a four, which needs to go right in front of the log. Notice it goes behind the plus or the minuses, right? It's like between the sign and the log. It becomes like a coefficient. Okay, so those I wanted to make sure that we covered because those were all problems that very similar to problems that you would see on the test. Okay, so now we're going to actually go back to the review and touch some of those problems that will also be similar to the ones on the test. And if anybody has any questions along the way, please feel free to interrupt me. You do not need to wait until the end. If you have any questions about anything I'm doing, let me know, okay? Okay, I'll post these when I post this review stuff. So going back to the beginning, it does mention again, 16 questions on the test. They're each this much. One point you get for selecting the correct answer, 5.25 you get from the work, except for some of the problems that I know you can just look at it and know the answer. There's a few of them. So those are nice. Um, if I have to see work, like I have to see steps, I'll run the directions. You must show your steps on this problem. Um, but for number one, it says, determine whether the function is one to one, okay? And that it gives like some reasoning there. We have to remember how we can tell if a function is one-to-one. -one. We use the vertical line test 
to tell us if it's actually a function or not. But we use the horizontal line test to tell us if it's one-to-one. -one. Right? So we don't need to do the vertical line test because it tells us this is the graph of a function. So I don't need to apply the vertical line test. But if I try to apply the horizontal line test, you just draw one horizontal line right there. And notice that I hit the graph two times. Okay, so the answer is no. And the why is because there is a horizontal line that intersects the graph at more than one point. See, if I had drawn a horizontal line up here, it only touches it at that one point, right? And if I would have touched, done a horizontal line here, it doesn't touch anything. Those are perfectly fine situations. But if you can draw even just one vertical line and it touches it twice or more, then it's not one-to-one, -one, okay? So we have to keep drawing all these horizontal lines. And if any one of them touches the graph more than twice, more than once, it's not one-to-one. -one. And if you're writing like your work right on the test, you would say no, and you would say either pass the horizontal line test or fails the horizontal line test. That's all you would say. And if you need to write notes on your to yourself, like how do you know that it passes and it's one to one? And how do you know it fails and it's one to one? Please write those notes, right? This case is if it touches it twice or more. This case is if it touches it once or not at all. It's fine. So number two, um, this is also asking us, um, Oh, it tells us it's one to one. It says for the function as defined that is one to one, graph F as a solid line and graph F inverse as a dashed line on the same axes. So remember, in order to graph this, I'm going to need two points. Now, just, just to kind of recall some stuff, okay? When you're looking at the graph of square root of X, that has this and the square root of one right? And it looks like that. So if I'm going to do the square root of x plus 5, remember when you shift inside function, it actually makes it go to the left. So it's actually here at negative 5, and then it does that thing, okay? So when I'm trying to graph it, I'm going to make sure that I, that I put the first x value at that starting point. And then I'm going to go just one more you know, to the right, which is negative four. So when I plug negative five in there, I get the square root is zero, which is zero. When I plug negative four here for X, negative four plus five is one, and the square root of one is one. Once I have those two points, I can graph this. It's gonna be negative one, two, three, four, five, and zero, and then negative four and one. And I would have my graph go like that. Okay, but it also wants to graph the inverse. Okay, so this is the original. This one is F. If I want F inverse, remember what we do. We swap the, the points. So this point would become zero, negative five, and this one would become one, negative four. That's how you find an inverse. So where is that at? That's at zero, and negative five, three, four, five. So that's here. And then one and negative four. That's here. Oops, wrong color. And so instead of going that way, it's going this way. I can't draw it right, but you get the idea. Okay. And if I was using actual graph paper, you'd be able to tell that over the line y equals x, these are mirror images of each other. And the only one that looks kind of like mine is this one over here. So you've got negative five, negative five, and it's just going in that direction. I guess they will cross each other at some point, 
but I don't know where that is. Nor am I asked to figure that out, right? They just wanted the graph. So for us, it would be this one here. I don't think I make you graph it. I think it's more like this one where I give you the graph and then you have to tell me if it's one to one. Okay, now same thing as this one. It says, they give me my function. It says, use the graph of F to sketch the inverse. Well, in order for me to do that, I have to have some points. So I need to kind of see, I'm gonna zoom in because it's really, really tiny and I can't even see it. So there it is. So I don't, I see, I see this point right here. I just don't know what the coordinates of that point are. So if this is 12, one, two, three, four, to get to 12, so that means they're going in increments of three, right? Three, six, nine, and then 12. So this right here would be six, okay? And then this also seems to be going in increments of three, so that would be three. So I have the point three comma, or I'm sorry, six comma three x value first, y value second, which means that my f inverse should have the point three, six, the reverse, okay? Let's go see if we can outrule without having to figure out what the heck those coordinates are. Um, but let's see if we can rule out a graph. So let's look and see if we have three and six, that would be here. And it looks like that one does have it on there. Here, three and six, not quite, right? It doesn't actually touch that little corner. Um, three and six, nope, the dotted line is nowhere near that point. And then three and six. Again, the graph, the dotted graph is nowhere near that point. So these two were pretty close, but this one was a little bit off, right? So it has the option A. You just needed to get one point swap the coordinates and find the graph that has that same point. Now we can zoom out. There we go. Okay. So now we're getting into some of the solving equations. So we're gonna go for these. Again, I'm gonna solve them using that secondary way that I explained. So for me, if I'm solving a problem like number four, um, this is an exponential with base one half. If I wanna solve for it, I'm gonna do the log of base one eighth of this side of the equation. And I'm gonna do log base one eighth of the other side of the equation, okay? Now we know if we have a base one eighth in my log and a base one eighth in my exponential, what's gonna happen to these is they're going to cancel. So these two guys are gonna cancel out and I'm just gonna be left with X. And over here, this is all numbers. So I should be able to type it in my calculator Problem is, is that I have to use the change of base formula first. So this has to turn into ln of 512 over ln of 1 8. Okay. And it does say um, type in an integer or a fraction. So it does not want me to round my answer. So hopefully this is a nice decimal or an actual number, but let's go check it out. So fraction button. Then I'm gonna type ln of 512 over ln of 1 8. Oops, not half, eight. So it looks exactly like it does on my paper. I'm gonna hit enter. Oh, and we do get a nice little number. We get x equal to negative three. So that would be what I type in here is negative three. And since I didn't have any logs in my original equation, I don't need to check to make sure that my arguments are positive, okay? So same thing with this one. I'm gonna do the same idea. 
So since it's an exponential base nine, I'm going to apply a log base nine on both sides of the equation. Do to one side, you have to do to the other side. But here, the log base nine and the exponential base nine cross each other out. And so all I have left is just X. And this is all numbers. It can be put in the calculator. You just have to use the change of base. So you have to do ln of the argument over ln of the base. And I don't know what that is. I think it's a fraction. ln of 3 over ln of 9. Yes, it is. It is 1 half. And again, I didn't have logs in my original, so I don't need to make sure that arguments are positive. So we just get 1 half for that one. Now for example six, it's the same thing. It's just there's two fractions, right? But my base here is three halves. So I'm gonna do log base three halves. Why am I not doing log base eight over 27? You go at the which one is the exponential expression. This is just a fraction all by its lonesome. This is something raised to the X. So this is the exponential expression. So that's the one that I need to put the log base of, okay? So then here again, the log base three halves and the exponential base three halves will cancel. And so I just get X. And then here you would do that change of base formula. So ln of eight over 27 over ln of three halves. And let's see what we get clear. So I'm gonna have fraction ln of eight over 27, so ln of three over two, and we get negative three. Okay, this one's interesting, but we definitely need to discuss them. Number seven and number eight. They are very interesting, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and try to do these. The same idea, um, except the problem with these two is that you have exponentials on both sides, don't you? Okay. Now, I could do the problem the way I've done it before, but it's a lot harder when you do that. However, I don't want to do it the secondary way because essentially what's happening here is I could write these as 2 to the power something. I could write these as 3 to the power something. But the one on the test, you can't make them both have the same base, okay? So I need to do these two problems in a way to where it didn't matter what the bases are, okay? So I'm gonna do the exact same thing I've been doing for all the problems. I just have to pick one of these, okay? Normally my brain goes from left to right. So I'm gonna do it on this side. This is an exponential with base 64. So I'm gonna have to apply log base 64 on both sides. Okay, now there, we know what's happening over here. The log base 64 and the exponential base 64 will cancel. And so all I'll have left is 5x. Over here though, you have to use a property that tells you if you have an exponent in the log, you can bring that exponent down, right? This guy can come to the front of the log. So it's two terms though. So both of those terms are going to go in front of this log. And remember, you cannot type that in the calculator like that. It does have to be um, 
changed into ln of the argument over ln of 64. And I don't know what that is. So let's see, fraction ln of 16 divided by ln of 64. And I get 2 thirds. So that fraction actually came out to 2 thirds. Well, guess what? That means we have to distribute this 2 thirds. So I'm actually going to come over here and do that. So I have 5x equal to 2 thirds times x plus 1 times 2 thirds, which is just 2 thirds. Now, this is a linear equation, right? There's no x squareds. So I'm just going to move all the x's together and then divide by the new coefficient. So I'm going to minus 2 thirds x on both sides. Let's see, 5 minus 2 thirds, what is that? Oh, it's 13 over 3. That's how many x's I have now. No more x's on this side, but I do have 2 thirds on that side. And then how do you get rid of this? You divide by 13 over 3. Divide by 13 over 3. So those would cancel and I'd have x all by itself. Supposedly it's supposed to be two over 13 when I'm done, but let's see. So fraction, and then in the top of this big fraction, I have another fraction, so two or three. At the bottom of this big fraction, I have 13 over three. So that looks right, right? You have two thirds on top, 13 thirds at the bottom. Hit enter, and we do get two over 13. And since there were no logs in the original, we don't need to make sure that it gives us positive arguments. There's no arguments. So our answer is just going to be 2 over 13. OK. I'll leave this one for later. It's very similar to this one. Very, very similar. OK, it's just different numbers. But I'll leave that one to later because I want to keep make sure I don't have like what 12, 18 more minutes. I want to make sure that we cover some of these other problems. We'll come back to that one if we if we have time. So this one's a good one. Okay. Um, it says to find the future value. And then the other one says to find the present value. For a future value, write notes to yourself that that means A. So they want you to find A. Present value is P. So make sure you write those notes on your note sheet or somewhere so that you have it available, okay? Now for number nine, it says, find a future value and interest earned on this amount invested for seven years. If this is what's invested, then this is our P. Time is always gonna be T and that's a percentage. So that means my R equals 0 0.04. And there's two different scenarios here. So for part A, it's compounded semi-annually, which uses this formula. And then continuously uses this formula. So two totally different formulas for each of these parts. So we get practice with both, which is good. Okay. So for the first one, we're going to find all these numbers. So P is 8906.54. One is the number one. R is 0 0.04. N semi-annually means that N equals two, right? Semi-annually is twice per year. So then over here, we're gonna have two times the T, which was seven. I'm trying to squeeze it on my paper, but I will type it in the calculator. And it's money, so you always round money to the nearest hundred, which is the second decimal place, right? Pennies. So let's see, 8906.54 parentheses one plus fraction 0 0.04 over two, and then raise it to the two times seven. And we get 11751.99, since that zero will not change this nine. Okay, so that's what we get here. 
Then it says how much interest will earn. Well, if this is the amount that's in the account, your interest is always going to be that amount minus what you put in. So in our case, it's going to be that number minus the $8,906.54. So minus 890.54. We get 2845.45. And so that would be this number. And so far, I had some answers over here. So, so far, we're doing good. Now we have to go figure out what's going on in scenario B. Okay. So, scenario B is the same to two in, same future values, same principle, same time, same rate. It's just a different formula because it says those words continuously. Those words mean to use that formula, okay? Um, so for my formula, it's gonna be A equals P E to the R times T. So I'm gonna type that in my calculator. Eight. 906.54 E, and then it's 0 0.04 times 7. And I get 11784 points. That will change the 0 to a 1, so 51 cents, which is exactly what they had here. And then if I want to find the interest, remember your interest is going to be your amount after what you put in. So we just have to subtract that 8906.54. So 1174.51 minus 8906.54. And I get 2877.97, which is the correct number here. Okay, don't forget to write them in there, right? 11784.51, and the interest was 2877.97. Okay, so that one was good because it had a future value example for both cases. One where you were using this formula, and then another where you were doing it continuously. Keep in mind if you're going to yourself a note sheet, all the n values, right? So n equals one for annual, two for semi annual, four for quarterly, 12 for monthly, 52 for weekly, and 364, I think it was for um, daily. Okay. Because the problem on the test might not say semi annually, it might say something different, like quarterly or monthly or something. Now, number 10 is different. It doesn't want us to find A. This time they want us to find P. But it does say compounded quarterly. So that means that N would have to equal four. And I would have to use the formula that has the N, which is this formula. Um, my rate, so that means R is going to be 0 0.055, and then this is, they want to know P, so this dollar amount has to be A. That's what it's going to grow to, so that is the amount after the time. And then this right here is our T, T is equal to five. So we're going to plug everybody in and then try to solve this. I'm going to use this space here since I'm probably not going to have time to cover this problem. Um, so let's see, A will be 9,000. And then one plus 0 0.055 over four, and then four times five. Now I cannot type in the whole thing in my calculator, but I can type in all of this to see what P is being multiplied by, okay? So we're gonna do one plus fraction 0 0.055 over four, raised to the four times five. 
and we get that it's multiplied by this number. I'm just gonna put three dots, okay? But when you're taking P times a number and you wanna solve for P, you do the opposite of that multiplication, which is to divide. So I'm gonna divide both sides by this number, okay? And it will cancel here. And on the other side, I'm not sure, 9,000 divided by this number. I just copied it in there. And I get 6848.97. And that is what they had there too, right? 64897. 6848.97. Okay. And these little IDs that you see just tells you what section numbers, right? These problems are from 4.2. So if you want to go look for similar ones, you can go find them in that particular section. Okay, let's see. We're going to get, we'll probably be able to cover all of these conversion ones, um, but we might not be able to cover the rest of it. I can always keep recording after class is over and then post all of them. But I'll only post the ones that I had marked as like crucial to study for the test, okay? Um, so for this one, it says converted. So you do have to use that rule. This is the definition. So make sure you use it and you put all the people where they belong, okay? So the base should stay the base. And then the other two numbers really switch sides. So um, if the base stay the base, I need an exponential form. So somebody needs to be the exponent. It's definitely not gonna be the 16 because the 16 was already attached to the four. So it has to be the two. And then the 16 has to get kicked to the other side. Notice how they swap places, right? Here, the A was with the B and over here, A is on the other side. And so in here, since they already have the equal 16, you would just write in the four squared. So we have a couple more. Again, we're using that same property. So I'm gonna kind of hold it right here because we're gonna do it again. Now it's going the other way around. So we have the exponential form and we want this form. So notice whatever this base is, it's the base of the log. So this would be log with the base four and then the two and the 16 switch sides. So now the 16 is over there with the four and the two is kicked over to the other side, okay? Since they already have log base four, you're just gonna type in 16 and two in the web assign, or not web assign, uh, my math lab. Now here's also the same thing. So they're starting with an exponential and they want the log. So it's gonna be log with this base six and then the one, two, nine, six, and the four gets kicked over to the other side. Same thing here, it's a log, we want an exponential. So it'll be base five, but the exponent cannot be 125 because 125 was already next to the five. So it has to be a three exponent. And that makes sense, five cubed is 125. So again, here they already had log six. So just type in this number and this number. And here they already have the 125. So just type in the five cubed. Okay, now I'm gonna do any of these particular problems. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Come on, phone. There we go, so I got about six minutes. So maybe we'll be able to solve this equation. So we hadn't had a log equation where it had one log only and not logs on both sides, okay? If you have one log only, you do have to apply your uh, rules. So remember, whatever the base is here, you're gonna apply that. So this is a log equation. So in order for me to do get rid of a log, I have to do this opposite, which is an exponential. And when you apply exponentials, you have to have a base. Since the base of the log is x plus four, I'm going to say x plus four is my base is raised 
to the left hand side. This is gonna be really weird. And x plus four needs to get raised to the right hand side. So notice that I just took x plus four and wrote this as the exponent and then equals and then x plus four again and put this as the exponent. Why did I do that? Because a log base and an exponential base cancel each other out. And so all I have here is eight. And anything to the first power is just that same thing. And if I continue solving for x, I would get x equal to four. And then you just have to make sure that when you plug it in, it keeps your arguments and your base is positive. And it's positive, right? Eight, four plus four is eight, and that's a positive base. So the answer here is um, four. So this problem here, this one has a lot to do with your calculator, both of these problems, okay? So for here, it wants me to find the pH level and it gives me the hydronium ion concentration. So I basically know that that number is gonna get plugged in. So if I wanna find pH, I do negative log of this number. And that's no big thing. I can just type all of that in my calculator. Negative log 5.5 .5 times 10 raised to the negative six. Get down and close my parentheses. And it tells me the answer. It says round to the nearest 10th. So it's about 5.3 since the five changed the two to a three. So that one's the easy one. The other one's a little bit more complicated and we have to play around with our calculator, okay? So this one, it's telling me that the pH is 5.4 and they want me to find this ion, uh, hydronium ion concentrate. So this number is gonna be the 5.4 and I'm not gonna leave that. I'm just gonna put like maybe an H. I don't wanna write all those symbols. Um, so 5.4 equals the negative log of something. Okay, my job is to figure out what that number is. So I'm going to first divide the negative one. So I get negative 5.4 equals log base H. And then you have to remember what the base is when you see just log by itself. When you see log all by itself, it's automatically a 10. When you see LN by itself, it's automatically an E. Okay. So if I'm going to do this, I need to get rid of this log, which means I'm gonna do the exponential 10 raised on this side and the exponential 10 raised on the other side. So the exponential base 10 and the log base 10 cancel. And I end up with 10 to the negative 5.4 equal to H. That would be great. That would be my answer, but it's not. The computer says it wants your answer in scientific notation. So what we have to do is go to your mode and change it to science mode. Hit enter to highlight it and then quit. And then type in 10 raised to the negative 5.4. And you have to round to just one decimal place. So this eight is gonna turn this into a 10, which means it would be a 4.0. And then you have times 10 to the negative six. And that's what would go in here, 4.0 times 10 to the negative six. Make sure you change your calculator because if the very next problem has that, look at how it gives you the answers. And don't write this as the answer because that's wrong, okay? So make sure after you do this problem, that you go back to your mode and put it back on normal and then quit. And now we wanna type in ln of two, it just gives me the regular decimal, okay? Not scientific notation. Okay, I think I ran out of class time. Yep, it's now 1.30. So I did finish most of the only one I'm gonna continue recording is um, number eight. That's the one I kind of skipped over. You do have an example, but I'll finish this one. Um, but if you do need to leave, you are free um, to go.
and I will see you guys. Oh, I won't see you on Tuesday because you'll be taking your test. So I won't see you for a whole week almost. Okay. Um, not until Tuesday. I think it's the December 20 or not December. It's November 29th. Okay. So you guys have a good one. I'll send you a text remind if I need to. Okay. And good luck on your test. Okay, sorry for that pause. I'm going to go ahead and finish up this last, last section. Just this one problem. So again, I'm going to do the um, opposite of this base. So I'm going to do log base 81 and do that same thing on both sides, the exact same thing. You cannot do log 81 over here and then log of 729 over there. It has to be the same base on both. So since I did log 81 over here, I have to do it over there as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here they will cancel, okay? And we'll end up with just the three X minus six. That's nice. Here, we have to take this exponent and bring it down. You can't apply the change of base formula until that exponent is down. Okay, so I'm going to bring that down and then I'm going to have log base 81 of just the 729. Okay, and that part we can do the change of base formula. So it would be ln of 729 over ln of 81, and that one might be a nice number. Um, we get three halves, so it's still a fraction. Bummer. Fractions are not the end of the world. They're just not preferable. But we get to use our calculators, so not too, too bad. Um, so let's distribute that three halves. So we have three X minus six equal to three halves times X plus three halves times three which is nine halves. And since this is a linear equation, I'm gonna move all of my X's over to this side. And then I'm gonna move my constant to the other side. So that will cancel my X's over here and my constant over there. Let's see, three minus three halves happens to be three halves, positive. And then nine halves plus six, is 21 over two. So I'm gonna divide both sides by three halves. That will cancel this three halves. And I will get X equal, it says it's supposed to be seven, but let's make sure. Fraction. Top of this fraction is 21 over two. Bottom of this fraction is three halves. And we do get seven. So um, there's no logs to plug the seven into. So seven is, we're pretty sure seven is the guaranteed answer. Okay, so that is the end of this review. I hope you at least have these problems as reference for your um, test. And I wish you all the best of luck. Bye now.